Hey, and welcome to part two of my series of videos on a pre-Christian sacrificial site on Frösön in Jämtland, Sweden. The first episode was an introduction to the subject, and now I will get in into the into the finds themselves, and also look at uh, the calendric aspect of this these uh, ritual activities that took place around a tree during the late Viking Age. Uh, but first, I want to give you some more context, like talk a little bit about this place. So, where are we again? We're in Jämtland. It's um, an inland region in the northern part of Scandinavia. Uh, and, and around this island, Frösön, there are several place names that relate to cultic activity or deities, as you can see in the picture. Um, as you can see, there are five different places that are all called Hov, and Hov denotes some type of uh, cultic building or some type of cultic activity. It has religious connotations, cultic connotations. Uh, and apart from those, there are others like V and, uh, and Ulvi, which relates of course to Ulr, and then Norderön, which is the island of Njord. Right, but these Hove places, um, these are strewn across the landscape, five of them around this big lake, the Lake Storsjön. And, and at all of these places, all five of these places also are very close to medieval churches. And that is of course the case also on Fröseln. So that tells us there is a continuity of cult. Um, when, when Christianity came and took over, um, people went to the same place to practice the religion. And, uh, and uh, the, the place that was chosen for this cultic activity is not random. Um, the tree stood at a very, very sort of scenic, imposing place in the landscape. It's pretty high up on a hill, uh, overlooking Lake Storsjön and, and the mountains in the background. So, and some scholars have interpreted, interpreted this as um, a type of mythical landscape or something like that. The, uh, the tree itself represents Yggdrasil, the world tree. And then you have the cultural landscape, the agricultural landscape around it, which is Midgård, the, the world of men. And then across the lake at the other side, uh, by the horizon, is, are the mountains. And in the mountains, you know, here be monsters. There are the powers of chaos, the Jotuns and so on. So that would be Utgård. I don't know about that interpretation myself, but uh, at least likely the tree had some sort of connection to to uh, pre-christian thoughts about a world tree uh, so there's that a little bit more background to the to the place uh, to this place and when we move on and look at the the species of animals in the finds as i mentioned in the in the last video in the first video uh, bear is the predominant species in the material. 47% of, of the bones are from bears. Um, and then the second most common species in the find is pig. So, and there might be some sort of mythological connection there too. There are a few pieces to this puzzle that leads at least me to think that there, there might be some mythological connection to Freyr, because in the, in the myth, Freyr seems to be connected with pigs. So, um, we're, on, we're on the island of Freyr, Freyrsön, and the, the, the bone finds from this sacrificial site, as well as household waste uh, from nearby finds from the same period, show a higher amount of pig, pig bones on this island than, uh, than is usual 
for the region that it, more pig bones than normal for this region so perhaps somehow the pig was preferred in the economy and in the cultic activity and the island is named after Freyr so perhaps Another significant uh, aspect of this is the large amount, the total amount of wild game bones in the, in the find. 47% are bear bones and then there are 14% uh, elk bones, elk or moose. Uh, and then 3% of other wild game. So in total there's 64% wild game in these... In, in the find, uh, which does not reflect the normal sort of um, composition of, uh, of diets uh, in Viking Age Scandinavia. Household waste, finds of household waste from, from nearby locations have shown that they ate up to 25% wild game here in Jämtland during the Viking Age. And if we look at uh, find similar finds of household waste from southern Scandinavia, those percentages are way below, like 1 to 5% or something like that. So people ate a significantly higher amount of wild game than what was normal farther to the south. So we see that this hunting economy is um, a big part of this region's uh, of this region's economy. Yes, and uh, so we have forty-seven percent bear, we have twenty-two percent pig, and then fourteen percent moose. Those are the top three, and the remaining remaining percents are just uh, domestic animals: sheep, sheep or goat, and uh, and cattle. Um, yes. And then we can move on to talk a little bit about the calendric aspects of this. In the osteological analysis that was uh, made in 2009, the, the archaeologi archaeologists um, looked for seasonal indicators in the bone finds so they could um, discern at what time of year the animals were sacrificed, were killed and, and put down below the tree. So what this showed was that there are three distinct peaks in cultic activity or sacrificial activity at this, pla at this place. And those are in the autumn, uh, around mid-October perhaps, or just autumn gener generally. And uh, then in spring and in summer. So, but the summer, the, the peak in the summer is somewhat iffy. Uh, but at least the in the autumn and the spring, the the activity surged at this place. So, and if we look to the to the text sources to the calendric rites. Um, for example, in Olaf Saga Helga, there is talk of a bloat at the winter nights uh, in the autumn. And the sources speak of, of winter nights as a, a holiday, holiday, a, a calendric holiday, I guess, where you would uh, sacrifice to Freyr. So there's at least some instances in the in the sources where where autumn is the autumn rituals are connected to Freyr. So we have a a peak of of cultic activity around this tree on Freyrsson in the fall in the autumn, and the island itself is named after Freyr, and then the animal pig is chosen a lot of times as the preferred animal of sacrifice. So, but then we also have some interesting aspects of the bear's life cycle, its biological rhythm that correlates somewhat 
with these calendric rites, which I find very interesting. So the bear, the bear goes into hibernation around the same time as the winter nights. Uh, there's of course no exact date when, when all bears go into hibernation, but there's also no exact date of the winter nights because it fluctuates in, in relation to the lunisolar uh, calendar. So as you can see in the picture, there's the autumnal equinox and uh, then there's a, a period before uh, after a period after that you celebrate winter nights and this has to do with the moon cycle somehow i couldn't explain it to you fully but it fluctuates depending on the moon cycle in relation to the solar cycle which are not in sync uh, so the bear goes to sleep uh, around the winter nights and then the bear wakes up in spring right around the time of the summer nights. Interesting connection. And if we look at the medieval law codes of Scandinavia, several of the Swedish medieval law codes state that states that the hunting season starts at winter nights and then ends at summer nights. Uh, so the autumn, winter and early spring is the hunting season. And this is also the time of year when the bear goes to sleep. And in, in later folklore, uh, we know that people had this idea about uh, certain dates that were, were related to this life cycle of the bear, this biological clock of the bear. So uh, the bear would go to sleep around winter nights and this, ha this had a a normalized date in the later calendars which was 14th of October and then the bear gives birth to her cubs in, around midwinter Yol, at 13th of January and also if it's not a female it the story goes that it turns around in its lair at this date and then uh, at summer nights it wakes up and uh, especially this last thing when when the bear wakes up is something that is still known among people here today and it's marked by a saint in the calendar uh, Saint Tiburtius so we call it Tiburtius Day and everyone knows that oh it's Tiburtius Day from now on the pigs the, the bears are waking up uh, so that motif sort of survived uh, through through um, a long period of time. So what we have is <clears throat> a more or less direct correlation between the biological rhythm of the bear and three out of four fairly well attested calendric rites in the pre-Christian uh, Scandinavian religions um, and then we have this connection to the pig um, I've also looked at other places where where, the, where a similar picture emerges for example Frösvi uh, which is farther to the south of in Sweden this site is uh, is earlier it's from the late migration period perhaps uh, Vendel period and it has, it's a cultic place in a, in a peat bog and pigs were sacrificed. And this, the same thing here, the seasonal indicators or the age of the animals suggest that uh, sacrifices took place in the autumn and that pigs were the preferred animals. So we have another example from archeology span where, where autumn, freyr and pigs are evident. So I think there might be a connection between the pigs in this final Freyasö. Um, the connection between pigs and the deity Freyr. And also the, the calendric aspect of it. That the winter nights was a time where, where you, the harvest is done. You slaughter your animals and you prepare the food for the winter. 
and uh, and uh, you give thanks or or something like that to the fertility god and you make sacrifices to him uh, for another year to be prosperous um so to summarize we have an an important place a place that was important in connection to power and aristocracy but also cultic activity and it has an a very scenic place in the landscape and it seems to have been a natural place to to have these types of activities and then we have the bear the bear find the bare bones which has an interesting connection to the calendric rites as well and then we have uh, the pig bones that seems to perhaps relate to Freyr. Uh, and in the next video I will go more into the bear because we've only just scraped the surface of that whole subject but uh, that's for another time. So for now I just um, thank you and hope that you keep posted and keep watching my videos and share my videos. Yeah, thank you.